Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Army Real Talk with Nzinga Curry and Lieutenant Colonel Eugene Irving. Now let's get real. Speaking of getting real, let's talk about Army talent management. I'm hearing a lot about Army talent management, the different changes taking place to strengthen an already strong Army. I read an article on AUSA.org about cyber talent and how the Cyber Command is working to retain and recruit top technical talent. But the Army Talent Management Task Force isn't just focusing on cyber. Changes are being made across the board. Did you have a chance to listen to AUSA's Army Matters Thought Leader segment featuring General McGee? I did. It aired on the 23rd of September. He provided a great overview on the Talent Management Task Force. This was very timely, which prepared us for our conversation with a few members of the task force. That was such a good session. Heck, that group made things plain, even for me, as I continued to learn about Army modernization. But why the change now? Wasn't the old system good enough? I have no complaints, but here's what Lieutenant Colonel Luke Hightower said about the change in the Army talent management overall. The talent management task force is an instrument of the of the Department of the Army that provides oversight for the implementation of the Army's personnel policy forms that, uh, that are focused on talent management. And while it was chartered a few years ago, uh, it's since been enlarged and reorganized to a point that it's uh, approximately four times larger now than it was a year ago, as we shifted to an, ex- uh, an expansion of our implementation, and a deeper implementation of talent management throughout our force. Um, someone might ask, you know, why are we, why are we changing towards a system talent management from what we had before? And while the current officer uh, personnel management system that's been in place for greater than 20 years now served the Army reasonably well and uh, demonstrated some grace over all of our activities and all of our missions over the past, past years, we can definitely see the need to modernize how we manage our people and how we handle our people. Uh, you know, first and foremost, if you think about the Army is uh, the Army size and scope of its operations and significance of its missions, given everything that the Army does for the country, it really needs to be the best and set the standard for personnel management. Uh, secondly, you know, we, we feel that if we appropriately execute talent management within our force, it's going to give us a decisive advantage against near peer threats, and near peer enemies. Uh, thirdly, you know, we need to acknowledge that the world is changing very, very, very rapidly. And the Army needs to be able to adapt to new technologies and new norms in order to remain competitive on a global scale. And you know, we need to recognize that there's changing generational norms uh, within our society. And while the Army needs to remain consistent to itself and to its identity, we do need to acknowledge that soldiers may have new expectations for their career, new expectations for the family, and their spouses may have new expectations that we need to consider. Okay, that makes things a little clearer. But what about Congress authorizations? How has Congress helped the Army acquire, develop, employ, and retain officers? Don't you remember when Lieutenant Colonel Hightower spoke about this? Take a listen. The 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, uh, signed in the name of Senator John S. McCain, did grant uh, a number of new authorities to all the armed services that will help them uh, leverage some flexibility in personnel management, um, specifically focusing on talent management. Uh, One of those uh, key authorities and one that I'm personally involved in is the authority uh, to grant officers the ability to opt out of their promotion boards in some cases. Uh, we're currently drafting policy and we hope to have, have it implemented in, in the, over the course of the next year. But now for the first time in known memory, an officer who is going before a, uh, a promotion board, a scheduled promotion board, if they meet have certain criteria, and if they're in certain situations, they'll be able to opt out of that and essentially defer the promotion for some time. You know, if we talk the specifics of the legislation, it's it's so that they can pursue advanced education, pursue special broadening opportunities, or to you know, work on some developmental assignments that may have been offset or deferred initially for you know, education or for special uh, special positions. 
we're targeting the active component, you know, active duty officers for implementation first, but the authorization is going to eventually be offered to a um, reserve component in the National Guard. Well, what about assessments? How will assessments be handled as a result of the change? Lieutenant Colonel Caton Johnson spoke about assessments to include GREs. You likely blanked out as you reflected on your GRE days. Hashtag LOL. But here's what he said. You know, the, the Army for a, a long time is very comfortable with, with commanders evaluating their, their, uh, their personnel. And really, when we look at assessments, uh, we're talking about things that are, are more of a common lens, objective, standardized way of being able to observe someone's talents. And one of the ones that the Army is probably the most comfortable with is our uh, physical fitness assessments, our APFT currently. And, and I think it's no secret that the Army's working to modernize that assessment instrument. So as, as the Army is, uh, is doing that uh, with physical fitness, we in the talent management realm are also looking at other ways that we can measure someone's talents. Uh, really, that falls into two, two principal domains, both in the cognitive side and in the non-cognitive side. So in the cognitive side, we're really talking about people, how they think, right? And in the other, in the non-cognitive, we, we really address and try to measure attributes related to how people think and, or excuse me, how people feel. Um, so, so when we talk about the, the structure of how we're approaching assessments, we're looking at, at two kind of categories, if you will. First is building a, a career assessment structure where we would implement assessments across the life cycle of an officer's career to gain insights about their talents and be able to inform talent management decisions as well as, back to your earlier question, develop that officer by, by giving them the awareness of what their talents are and maybe what some of their, their weaknesses are so they could mitigate or develop those weaknesses into a stronger, stronger uh, attribute. So building that career assessment structure is, is one of the categories. The other one is integrating assessments into some of our selection processes. And we'll, I think we'll get to that one a little bit later on. So you mentioned the GRE. We've all read about the GRE in the Army, right? It's been all over social media and the, the Secretary's policy to, to administer the GRE to captains as they go through the captain's career course. So we've identified the, our professional military education breaks in a career as a logical point to be able to assess officers and, and really be able to catch most of our officers as they go through those gateways in their career. Right. One of the ways, or one of the ways we're doing that is by implementing the GRE. Right. Uh, the GRE is purpose that the Army is using it for is to identify the potential uh, that officers demonstrate to participate in competitive education programs. I think, as most people know, the GRE is a measure of, of someone's ability to succeed in the first year of a graduate program, and hence why it's so widely accepted across the academic world uh, as an indicator of someone's potential to participate or to succeed in a graduate education program. Lieutenant Colonel Johnson continues speaking about CSL selection, also known as the Battalion Command Selection Process. The idea behind this is that we better inform this decision. The current process involves a board meeting at Fort Knox, as we're all very familiar with, reviewing uh, evaluations of, of someone's perform past performance and the measure of potential that their, their boss has had, right? So the idea of moving into the future is we, we integrate assessments to complement that data point with additional data points along other attributes such as someone's cognitive and non-cognitive skills, someone's uh, ability to write and communicate and speak. So the idea is to, to integrate assessments into that selection process. And we, we began with some guidance uh, around the end of last year, beginning of this year, to pilot this, this effort. So over this past summer, we did execute a pilot down at Fort Benning uh, with infantry and armor officers uh, who were on last year's alternate list. 
and we ran them through a series of cognitive and non-cognitive assessments focused on those competencies and attributes that we desire in our leadership. Things like the ability to communicate well, other cognitive and non-cognitive abilities and traits that, that we would want to see in our, our leadership at the battalion command level. So that pilot uh, ran over the last summer and, and yielded some significant results uh, with regards to our ability to, to measure uh, those attributes and competencies and our ability to integrate that into a selection process uh, at the 05 or the Lieutenant Colonel CSL level. So we received planning guidance to integrate it fully across the board or to plan to integrate it fully across the board for this FY fiscal year 21 CSL board or process, selection process. We're currently waiting on a final decision to execute, but we could see it extending to the Army as, as early as this board that's ongoing right now and, and the process that's ongoing right now. Wow, the Army will start administering the GRE? You are right, Lieutenant Colonel Irby. I was reflecting on my GRE days. The math section kicked my butt, but thankfully I was able to move forward and actually make it to graduate school. Anyway, I now understand how the Army assess officers, but how are they going to align soldiers to the different positions? Major Greg Lockhart made it plain. Check out what he had to say about that. So we're gonna do that through the uh, Army Talent Alignment Process, or ATAP. And what ATAP is, it's a decentralized, regulated market-style system that aligns officers with jobs or preferences. But what it really is, it's a, it's a process for officers and units to interact with each other, uh, initiate a dialogue, and they do this by entering information into AIM 2.0 for the officer through their resume, and for units uh, through their unit pages and their desired KSBs. And the ultimate goal is to put the right officer with the right unit in the right job at the right time. See Simple, he also shared the difference between ATAP and how the Army historically managed officers' careers. Wait, wait, what does ATAP stand for again? ATAP stands for Army Talent Alignment Process. Major Lockhart was really informative and shared the difference between ATAP and past practices, as well as the unit responsibilities and officers' responsibilities in the process. I think the key difference is the process is more transparent. Officers see a wider variety of jobs in the market and are matched to available jobs based on their preferences. Units can now look at the entire pool of officers as well, and they can select the officers that are the best match for their team. The other difference is, is the process is very information-based. Officers and units now provide each other with detailed information about themselves that can impact how both the officer and the unit preference. Units need to fill out their desired KSBs. I also recommend that they update their unit pages and also the incumbent information that's listed in AIM 2.0. And if you don't have an incumbent for a position, put a unit point of contact in there. So that allows the officer to initiate dialogue with the unit if they're interested. Uh, I would also encourage the, off, uh, the unit to uh, reach out to officers that they're interested in and initiate the dialogue if they're not getting dialogue from, the, from officers they are interested in. And then preference a good number of offers, officers through the ATOP process. The more officers you preference, the more likely you are to get a match when the uh, algorithm runs. The first thing I would do if I was an officer is I would update my resume. Uh, ensure your ORB is updated uh, as well as your DA photo. Go into your resume and fill out your knowledge, skills, and behaviors or your KSPs. And then you have some blocks on page two of your resume and ensure they're filled out. This gives the unit a great snapshot of who you are. The second thing I would do is when ATAP opens, don't be afraid to reach out to the units you're interested in. Dialogue and interaction is a big piece of this entire process, and without that, you may not get matched correctly. And then, like I said for the units earlier, preference as many assignments as you can. This creates a higher likelihood you'll get a match in the process. So, Ms. Curry, are you following? I know the Army loves to use acronyms, and things can get a bit confusing sometimes. It is all making sense. Major Maria Huff also discussed a little about Army Talent Alignment Process, or should I say ATAP, and expounded on brevement promotions. All right, so let me just chime in a little bit about brevement promotions. So the promotions, I mean, the positions will be included in the market under the Army um, Talent Alignment Process in AIM 2.0. Again, the Army is exploring how to temp 
temporarily promote army officers to the next rank if they are selected to fill a position that the army designates as critical. Again, this is what Brevet is. The Brevet um, promotion program is intended to alleviate critical shortages of officers, to better leverage the talents of these junior officers, and to incentivize retention of officers in whom the Army has invested for education and experiences. Um, here are five things that Brevet does. First of all, it increases readiness for hard to fill positions that require volunteers. Second, it incentivizes officers and shapes their behaviors. And it's a func um, forcing function to use um, the um, A2.0. Um, third, it better aligns um, for talent. Fourth, it rewards officers that have the knowledge, skills, and behaviors and preferences. And then fifth, it is potentially a pilot for a talent-based promotion system that we can use in the future. So the Army will pilot brevet promotions by opening 200 positions um, during the summer 2020 um, assignment cycle and up to 70, I mean 770 positions next year. Basically what brevet promotions is, unlike frogging, is officers who have the knowledge, skills, and behaviors and preferences will get temporarily promoted to the next higher rank and they get the pay and all the incentives that come with that um, promotion. So the process starts with the critical positions. So these critical positions are validated and approved annually by the Secretary of the Army. Um, the next step of that process is the nomination part of it, where they use AIM 2.0 and the ATAP process to um, self-nominate themselves um, based on their knowledge and skills that they have earned through training, education, um, based on military and civilian education and then their behaviors and then preferences, like I already spoke about, um, hard to fill positions. Um, they will go through a validation process where a panel will match them with that critical position to ensure that the right person is matched with the right position for employment or for work. Um, the next part of it, all personnel who are brevet promoted have to go through Senate confirmation. And then the last part is assigning that person and promoting that person. One thing to keep in mind is that that person will wear the rank and get the pay while they are in that position. Once they leave that position, they will revert back to their permanent rank unless they are promoted while they are in the brevet promotion. So officers who are eligible for brevet promotions are 03 captains through 06 full bird colonel. They are eligible for brevet promotions. So what is the difference between brevet and merit-based promotions? Well, basically, brevet promotions are temporary promotions used to fill critical positions. Under the new program, the brevet officer receives financial compensation of the new rank while in the brevet status. Now, merit-based promotion modifies the old data rank seniority order promotion list. Now, top performers will be promoted first, and the remaining officers will be promoted by seniority. Yeah, check this clip out. Most officers, most everybody else is familiar with the promotion zones that have previously occurred in officer promotions, whether they be below the zone, in the, in the promotion zone, or the primary zone, and above the zone. With the new authority to grant merit-based promotions, you're going to deviate from that slightly in that the initial series of officers who were promoted off of any promotion list will be done so based upon merit as their promotion files performed uh, on the promotion board, regardless of their, their current data rank at their current grade. So if they're competing for a below the zone or a primary zone promotion and they go before a promotion board, however their file is scored by that board, if it's the strongest file on the board and they're the most junior officer, then they'll more than likely come out at the top of the promotion list once it's published. And then their, you know, the sequence in which they're promoted will be will be first in that case. Uh, second officer might be a PZ officer, might be a BZ officer, who knows, might be an AZ officer. It all depends on the individual merit of that promotion file. And we're going to arrive at that uh, using a, you know, an algorithm. So all prom promotion board files will be reviewed as they historically have in the past. 
each will be individually scored by the promotion board as they have in the past. But then once that uh, initial promotion list is, is stacked uh, in order of merit, an algorithm will be used to determine the top, the cluster of the top performing files from the board. And then that will be in turn turned into an improved promotion list. I was going to add one thing to keep in mind is that the directive will only apply to major lieutenant colonel and colonel selection boards and only applies to the active component. Wow, that is such good information. Now I can be an Army talent management specialist. No, not so fast. Make sure to stay tuned in to follow and learn about new ATAP policies and initiatives as the Army talent management process is set in motion. To the listeners currently attending AUSA's annual meeting, be sure to check out the Army Talent Management Task Force Contemporary Military Forum scheduled for this Wednesday, 16 October, from 10 o'clock to 1145. They will be located in room 147 Alpha Bravo of the Washington Convention Center. Also, here's a bit of information about the Warriors Corner. Tony, you should mention that in Zinga. You know, the Talent Management Task Force will have some Warriors Corners as well as a kiosk set up throughout the event that folks can come by and learn more about what we're doing. Hope to see you there. I would like to thank the Talent Management Task Force team for coming out and providing the real insight for our Real Talk podcast. Yes, I agree. It was really great. I also thank Lieutenant Colonel Hightower, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, Major Lockhart, and Major Huff, as well as the entire Army Talent Management Task Force team.